We've noted how thinking intersectionally helps us to understand and evaluate the development of particular legal and social patterns. Now let's turn to the larger question of how we might think about the experiences of different sorts of women in the context of a democratic society. How do women's perceptions of themselves, their relationships to each other, influence the campaign for the vote? Do women's multiple identities, their different hats, affect the strategies women adopt, the length of time it takes to achieve the vote, and their political stances thereafter? When we left women's rights advocates in the 1870s, the women's movement was divided into two parts, the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association. These two parts had divided, you'll remember, over the question of whether to demand the vote for women when it was given to African-American males. Stanton and Anthony, heading the NWSA, the National Women's Suffrage Association, believed that the fight for Negro rights could not precede that for women because doing so would provide ignorant black men with a vote while continuing to deprive even educated women of it. The NWSA turned its attention to the separate states, hoping to reach universal suffrage that way. Lucy Stone, in contrast, led the American Women's Suffrage Association, the AWSA, into a continuing campaign to encourage Congress to change its mind. She argued that depriving women of the vote was to deprive them of essential human rights. Finally, in 1890, the two groups came together. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton made friends with the Stone faction, joining forces in the National American Women's Suffrage Association. This coalition led the efforts of women from the late 19th century through the passage of the suffrage amendment in 1919 and ratification in 1920. Stanton, by now 75 years old, served for two years as president of the NWSA. She was succeeded by 72-year-old Anthony, who presided until 1900, and then by a younger generation led by Carrie Chapman Catt. These leaders united over twin arguments for women's suffrage. First, that women deserved suffrage as a natural right, the same argument used by men. And second, that women's vote would provide a moral leaven in the electorate. Suffragists did not hesitate to use what we would now regard as racist arguments to make their points. To wit, a woman's vote, they argued, would counteract the ballots cast by uneducated African Americans and corrupt immigrants. Faced with the racism of white men and the ambivalent sexism of black men, black women created a parallel suffrage movement that tended to cohere around local groups of middle-class black women and that often joined local Republican Party committees to persuade them to their views. Opposition to suffrage came from women who feared disruption of the family. We've seen how the commitment of white women to motherhood and the home shaped the attitudes of legislators and reformers to wage earning women. The same sensibilities colored the positions that many white native born middle income women took towards suffrage. Women's primary task, they argued, was to care for the home and children and to dispense charity to the needy. God required the obedience of wives to their husbands. Disobedient women, women who exercised their own voices, could not do so without disobeying heavenly rules. Besides, to give all women the vote would dramatically increase the numbers of women, poor women, who could not commit to the home in the same way. It would undermine the morality of the electorate.